Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Annie Reisowitz, the Communications Advisor for the F3 Future of Fish Feed team. I'd like to begin by introducing Dr. Kevin Fitzsimmons, Chair of the F3 team, who will be moderating today's webinar. As many of you may know, Kevin is a professor at the University of Arizona, the former president of the World Aquaculture Society, and currently leading an EU project on sustainable aquaculture in Myanmar. Before we get started, I would also like to let you know that if you have any questions during the webinar, you can type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will address them during the Q&A session following the panelists' presentations. With that, I'll hand it over to Kevin. Thank you, Annie, appreciate it. Uh, I want to again welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for algae and seed oils in aquafeeds. This is the fourth in our series of monthly F3 webinars that we're hosting on the latest advances in aquaculture feed ingredients to replace fish meal and fish oil. And just as a reminder, why do we need these replacements? Well, it's because wild fish uh, are a declining resource and without replacements, aquaculture is going to be bottlenecked and cannot grow to feed a world of 9 billion people. But replacements are around the corner. Our seminars feature the most promising ingredients so that aquaculture can continue to grow sustainably. Okay, um, so for our final ingredient focused webinar, we've invited key players from the omega-3 oil market. Because of the declining and fluctuating supply of wild-caught forage fish, the aquafeed industry needs new sources of omega-3 rich DHA and EPA to secure a more sustainable supply chain. Algae and seed oils are on the cutting edge of innovation in this field. Both macro and microalgaes, as well as some genetically engineered terrestrial plants are quickly stepping up to supply both the fish feed and human nutrition markets with omega-3 uh, oils. We look forward to hearing more about their progress, so let's get started. Uh, first, we've got Dr. David Hazelbeck, who's the CEO of Global Algae Innovations. David founded Global Algae in 2013 to develop algae solutions for global dilemmas. The company is pre-commercial for aquaculture feed ingredients and is currently in the design phase for a 160-acre farm. David also founded Global Algae Equipment, which is currently selling its first product, the Zobi Harvester, which improves algae harvesting and dewater technology. David received his PhD in chemical engineering from the University of California, San Diego, and has over 30 years experience in chemical and biological research and development. We're thankful to ha have David's expertise on our panel today. So Alex, let's go ahead with David, please. Hi, I'm Dave Hazelbeck, CEO of Global Algae Innovations. Thank you for the opportunity to share our vision for creating an abundant and sustainable world and its implications for aquaculture feeds. We call this the algae revolution because algae farming will fundamentally change our agricultural paradigm. Currently, our forests, grasslands, rivers, watersheds, oceans, and even climate are being strained to the breaking point in order to feed the world. The algae revolution involves a transformation in agriculture, where in the future, the majority of our animal and aquaculture feed is produced by algae farms. This will create a world in which there is plenty of land, water, and ocean resources for food and for natural habitats, what we call an abundant and sustainable world. Global Algae Innovations was founded in 2013 with the vision to harness the unparalleled productivity of algae to provide food and fuel for the world, dramatically improving the environment, economy, and quality of life for all people. In order to achieve this vision, we needed to move algae from producing high-value niche products to producing commodities in the food and feed markets. We've developed algae farming methods produce an algae that's about 40% protein and 45% lipid. We separate this algae into two primary product streams. A meal, which is about 70% protein, that goes into food that can be used for food and feed ingredients, 
and then oil, which we fractionate into three main products. Omega-3s, which would go into feed markets, unsaturated oils, which would go into consumer products and polymers, and saturated oils, which would be used to make jet fuel, diesel fuel, and gasoline. This is a photograph of our current research and development farm. It has eight acres of raceways, and the largest one is about three acres. Conventional algae production technology is 10 times too expensive for commodities. So we have spent the past seven years developing radical innovations in every process step to reduce the cost of algae farming for products in the $1 to $2 a kilogram range. We have achieved the goals of this technology development and are currently working to scale up the te this technology suite. Achieving commodity pricing requires both the technology and algae farming at commercial scale. We're, we're envisioning a two-step scale-up from our current 8-acre facility to 160 acres and then to a 5,000-acre farm. This will reduce the cost from the current high-value products at $20 a kilogram down to about $5 a kilogram at Farm 160, and finally, competing with commodities at full commercial scale. We've completed the initial research and development, and we're currently in the design phase for this scale-up, and are working to arrange the financing to build and operate the facility. Our current R&D farm is located in Hawaii. Farm 160 is being built in California, we then plan to expand to a 5,000 acre facility in the U.S., followed by rapid and parallel expansion throughout the world. We anticipate building Farm 160 in 20, and operating it in 2022, then moving to build Farm 5000 in 2024, followed by a rapid parallel uh, licensing and franchising to expand number of acres in algae farming to achieve a million acres by 2030. I began this talk by describing an abundant, sustainable world. So how does algae farming create such a world? The key is productivity. These two graphs look at protein yield as a function of land input, inputs and, water, and as a function of water inputs. The first graph is tons of protein produced per hectare per year. You can see what's been achieved through the Green Revolution over the past 60 years, about a threefold in improvement in productivity. Algae farming jumps that another 40-fold. Similarly, looking at water, this is grams of protein produced per liter of water, and comparing algae to many of the other sources of protein, you can see that, again, algae is dramatically higher productivity than any other source of protein. This level of productivity increase is really unprecedented in the history of the world, and it's exactly what we need today to meet our environmental and societal dilemmas. As an example, let's look at deforestation. Despite tremendous international efforts to reduce deforestation rates, we still have rapid deforestation occurring around the world. And that's because of the many societal benefits that come from the farming or palm oil plantations that lead to this deforestation. Algae addresses that root cause by producing more protein, more oil, and more revenue than conventional farms with a fraction of the water and land inputs. As a result, we obtain all of the societal benefits while stopping and reversing deforestation. This is particularly beneficial in Southeast Asia, where algae farms to supply oil to replace palm oil plantations will have a high-protein meal and omega-3 co-products that will support a sustainable and growing aquaculture industry. Thank you again for the opportunity to share a little bit about our vision for creating an abundant and sustainable world, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions.
All right, thank you, David. We appreciate that. Um, our next speaker is Pablo Berner, and Pablo is the aquaculture lead for New Seed. Pablo has an extensive background in salmon farming in Chile and Norway, and holds a master's in aquaculture from the Agriculture University of Norway. He has a passion for fish welfare and improving ocean environments, and uses this experience to support his role educating farmers and production companies about New Seed's Aquaterra product, which is an omega-3 from canola, canola oil, that is commercially available now and has the potential to double the world supply of DHA using less than 5% of the current canola acreage. We will hand it over to Pablo to hear more about Aquaterra. Good morning. Thanks to F3 for inviting us to share Aquaterra Advanced Omega-3. Aquaterra is a call to the aquaculture industry to nurture the land and sea. NUSID is an international organization. It has grown rapidly since its start in Australia in 2006. Our four global regions include Australia, Europe, North and South America. There are over 250 employees working across 11 global locations, including two world-class innovation centers, one in Victoria, Australia, and the other one in California. We are global leaders in agronomics and plant breeding, developing new agricultural solutions for environmental challenges, like our novel plant-based source of omega-3. New Seed developed omega-3 canola oil in close collaboration with recognized Australian institutions to increase the supply of DHA for aquaculture and close the existing gap of the essential long chain poly and saturated fatty acids. The ocean cannot supply enough to support industry growth. Aquaterra is designed as a feed ingredient, enhance, modernize and innovate the oil mix for aquafeeds. I would like to invite you to watch the short video. Until now, fish oil has been the primary source of omega-3 nutrients for the aquaculture and dietary supplement industries. The problem is that the ocean cannot sustainably provide enough omega-3 to meet minimum nutritional needs for an ever-growing global population. Collecting omega-3 from only wild fish pressures ocean ecosystems that provide income and food for people and habitats for marine animals. Consider also that fish ultimately derives omega-3s from microalgae. So why not just go direct to the source? Well, there are some factories growing microalgae for omega-3, helping to take pressure off the ocean. However, it takes lots of water and energy to produce these algal oils, making it an expensive and resource-intensive solution. New Seed takes a new approach by applying biotechnology to deliver the benefits of microalgae through canola, creating a DHA and ALA-rich source of land-based omega-3s. Just one hectare of New Seed's omega-3 canola produces an equivalent amount of DHA and EPA. And bonus, it grows on existing farmland, helping to replenish soil and provides habitats for over 2,000 beneficial insects, including honeybees. Plus, our grower contracts create new economic opportunities for farmers by managing the closed-loop supply chain and guaranteeing purchase. This stabilizes supply and costs for the aquaculture and nutrition industries. 
New Seeds Aquaterra and Nutraterra ensure reliable, renewable omega-3 production. Aquaterra is a product of sophisticated technology. We insert five microalgae genes and two GS genes into canola, giving a land-based crop the genetics to create its own long chain fatty acids. Our goal was to go all the way to DHA. Aquaterra offers a unique omega-3 profile that improves omega-3, omega-6 ratio, rising significantly the total omega-3 available on the oil. The aquaculture industry recognizes the need for new sources of omega-3 and came together to collaborate and validate Aquaterra. Our partners share new seeds dedication to innovation and proactive sustainability policies and supported every step of development. One concept and research development to create our technology. Second, food safety and viability for applications on aquafil. And third, commercial scale trials conducted in Chile with uh, important fish farming producers and also feed plant manufacturers. Aquaterra is part of recognized industry organizations to promote aquaculture, traceability, and human health. During 2018 and 2019, we performed three commercial scale trials. We hope to show Aquaterra is an effective omega-3 oil, but the result exceeds our expectations. We show improved mortality rates, improved feed conversion ratio, fish in, fish out reductions, favorable omega-3, omega-6 ratios. Complementing and replacing part of the fish oil from commercial diets. You can see in the left hand table, trial one, trial two, and trial three, we replace between 60 and 30% of fish oil with a constant EPA DHA content on feed. By the other hand, in the right hand table, you can see a standard diet today and the possibility which came with Aquaterra, replacing fish oil and also standard vegetable oil with a inclusion of 6%. You can have a equal and basis total oil uh, feed content. The results, we evaluate um, production results, yield, flesh quality, and we can show the feed conversion ratio was an, an, an feed feeding ratio was always uh, very positive for the Aguaterra diet. Among the most surprising results was the improved productivity, seen consistently in all the three trials. We attribute this to Aguaterra unique omega-3 profile, increasing total omega-3 in the fish, which improves health and welfare. The average survivability increases by 2%. This improvement is especially notable when fish are challenged. This chart shows fish mortality. Aquaterra is on the bottom and the control group is on top. The red spikes indicates an outbreak and you can see the Aquaterra fish fed were more resilient. Aguaterra's unique fatty acid profile provides DHA, EPA, and ELA for a total omega-3 content over 30%. Aguaterra increases the total omega-3 content on salmon fillet. By improving nutrition and adding value, aquaculture can become the center of the plate worldwide. Aquaculture is under pressure to reduce reliance of wild fish for feed. 
This is both to meet consumer demand for more sustainable food and in the industry need for sustainable growth. Aguaterra, as a partial replacement to fish oil, reduced fish forage dependency ratio oil by 61% and fish in fish oil ratio by up to 27%, depending on the inclusion rates on the performed trials. Over the last years, we have been building partnership within the industry. Best aquaculture practices and aquaculture students in council certifications are the most common and recognized certification for responsible aquaculture. Aquaterra is an island with those certifications. Last year, we had been nominated by the Global Aquaculture Alliance as an innovation of the year. We greatly appreciate recognition and customer support. After a period of six months evaluation, Nusitz Aquaterra had been recognized by Friends of the Sea for its responsible production and contribution to maintain oceans equilibrium. From February 2020, we are proud signatory members committed to the 10 principles of the United Nations Global Compact, working towards sustainable development goals with this emphasize zero hunger, good health and well-being, industry, innovation and infrastructure, life below water, life on land, and partnership for the goals. Aquaterra facilitates aquaculture growth and is able to double the world supply of DHA. Aquaterra delivers the benefit of omega-3 from seed to feed. The full supply chain is certified, traceable, by excellence through stewardship. The new seed logistics team built a reliable supply chain from the US to the aquaculture production markets with the majority of volume heading to Chile at the moment. Oil is a reliable novel source of omega-3. It is recognized by the industry and scientific leaders to play a major role on aquaculture sustainable growth. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day. Which is gracias, uh, Pablo. And uh, I just want to make a quick note um, for everybody. If you would please use uh, the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, um, that'll make it easier for us to get all of the questions in uh, instead of putting them in the chat box. Uh, it's a little harder for us to go back and forth. So please use the Q&A box for uh, sending in your questions. Okay, our next presenter, uh, Rud Pierbooms, is the president of Algae Ingredients for Corbion. Rude has spent most of his career in commercial roles in specialty food and ingredients and holds a Master of Science degree from Nyenrode uh, Business University in the Netherlands. He joined Corbion in 2014 as Senior Vice President for Food and has since become the president of Algae Ingredients and a member of Corbion's Executive Committee. He is also Chairman of Ingredients for Food Innovators. It's a uh, Dutch business network of food ingredient producers. So today, Rude is here to discuss Corbion's Algal Prime uh, DHA, which is produced uh, at capacity to meet the supply needs for today and with the ability to expand into the future. So let's see uh, Rude's presentation, please. I would like to thank the F3 team for inviting Corbion to participate in this webinar. From the founding days of the F3 effort, we support the research and advocacy work of the organization. My name is Ruud Pierbooms and I'm the president of LG Ingredients at Corbion. Corbion is a global leader in sustainable food solutions, lactic acid and LG ingredients, and we preserve what matters. Last April, I joined our LG Ingredients team after several years in the Corbion food ingredients business. I'm excited about the possibilities offered by the platform, 
because the combination of our LG technology and Corbion's vast experience in large-scale fermentation opens a world of sustainable opportunities for both food and feed applications. Hello, I am Diana Visser and I am the Senior Director of Sustainability at Corbion. After a career in biotechnology and food ingredient development, I applied my passion for sustainability into practice at Corbion. Our purpose is to preserve what matters by preserving food and food production, preserving health and preserving the planet. Our LG platform is an exciting area for us. It embodies all of Corbion's sustainability principles. Our sustainability efforts are recognized by various sustainability ratings. Corbion received the Platinum Sustainability Rating in the uh, Ecovades uh, CSR assessment, which places us at the top 1% of all suppliers in our sector globally. In addition, Corbion has been recognized for leadership in corporate sustainability by the global environmental nonprofit CDP, securing a place on its prestigious A-list for tackling climate change. I look forward to sharing more about the sustainability profile of Elgar Prime DHA. This webinar comes at a critical time. Not only are we in the middle of a pandemic, which has triggered questions about the sustainability of our food chain, we have also seen questions about the sustainability of the fishing industry. There is much to argue about recent publications, but there is no debate about the fact that we can continue to make improvements. So, actually, this may be our moment of opportunity. A recent survey conducted during COVID by a US firm Changing Tastes revealed that 32% of American adults wants to eat less meat. And their number one choice to replace meat is fish and seafood. Another interesting conclusion of the survey was that ocean health and our own health are connected through fish and seafood. And this perspective aligns with what we're seeing in the market. There's more and more focus on improving the nutritional and sustainable aspects of feed formulations. And long chain omega-3s are taking a central stage. Historically, fish oil was the only direct source of long chain omega-3s, but fish oil is a limited resource. There is about 1 million metric tons of uh, fish oil harvested from the ocean every year. Seafood farms depend on fish oil as a key ingredient for aquaculture feed. But with aquaculture production growing rapidly, the demand will exceed supply. And this is especially true for sustainable sources. Microalgae are the producers of long chain omega-3s. And in the wild, they are at the base of the food chain for fish. By now growing microalgae via fermentation, we take out the middle fish while still delivering the power of omega-3 to the feed. Elga Prime is an omega-3 rich algae feed ingredient produced by fermentation of sugar. And it's supplied in both liquid and powder to address the different market segment needs. We have been in the market for more than five years and we produce omega-3s at scale. And this means that we have the ability to meet the growing demand. Our production setup is fully circular and we have documented this in our LCA study. So in short, our LG production supports volume growth of the market. We do this in a sustainable way and the scale allows us to optimize costs by production efficiency and innovations in strain development. Adoption of Elka Prime is led by the salmon industry, but also the shrimp industry has been increasing the use of Elka Prime substantially over the last two years. Numerous studies conducted by the Nofema Research Institute have shown that higher levels of omega-3 improve the health of farmed fish, and this will lead to better production. We now see several salmon farmers moving to increase levels of omega-3 in their feed, and Elgar Prime is the perfect solution to do this in a sustainable way. It is estimated that algae omega-3s are now included in approximately 30% of Norwegian salmon feeds, and this number is growing. More farmers are using Elgar Prime, and the inclusion levels are increasing. We as Corbion are determined to support the industry. And as an example, we are participating in a new Nofima Millennial Salmon Study funded by the Norwegian government. This study will lay the necessary foundation for the creation of a salmon product that strikes the key principles for next generations of consumers. As we collectively work to make our industry more sustainable, 
by advocating alternative ingredients, we also need to be transparent about our own sustainability profile. I would like to invite Diana Visser to share an overview of Corbyn's and Elga Prime's sustainability profile. Thank you, Ruud. I'm happy to share that we have completed a full life cycle assessment for Elga Prime DHA. Uh, the assessment concluded uh, in 2020 and ISO uh, reviewed, uh, analyzed the cradle to gate environmental impact of Elga Prime DHA, covering the full supply chain, so including raw material sourcing and production. Further analysis was done with publicly available data and affirmed that Elga Prime has a lower carbon footprint compared to traditional sources of fish oil. Elga Prime's DHA low carbon footprint is due to three primary elements of its production system. Powered by renewable energy, the Elga Prime facility sits among sugarcane fields and is located next door to a sugarcane mill. The sugarcane waste is used as a renewable source of energy to fully power the sugar mill and the algae facility. High yield field stock. Sugarcane used to grow Elga Prime DHA via fermentation is one of the world's most productive sugar sources compared to other sugar feedstock sources like corn and wheat. This means that the more sugar produced per hectare of land, the more omega-3s can be produced per hectare. Efficient use of land. A hectare of land produces both the fuel and the feedstock to grow Elga Prime DHA with zero deforestation impact confirmed by historical satellite data. As part of our commitment to transparency, the Elgar Prime LCA is currently under peer review for scientific publication sometime this year. These past few months have brought a new perspective, especially for new generations and those who deeply care about protecting and preserving our planet. We believe that health and sustainability will continue to drive the demand for responsibly farmed seafood, and this will require traceable, nutritious and reliable feed ingredients. At Corbion, we preserve what matters. Well, thank you, Ruud. We really appreciate that and, and presentation with uh, your colleague there from Corbion. Okay, um, next up, we have Dr. Karim Gurmali, who is the CEO of Veramaris. Karim has been CEO of Veramaris since it was established in 2018. Previously, he spent 16 years working for Veramaris's parent company, DSM, where he was VP for Animal Nutrition and Health for the Asia, Pacific, and India. At Veramaris, Karim's uh, collaborative approach has been instrumental to the development of the business from concept to reality. Veramaris was the winner of the F3 Fish Oil Challenge, and we're happy that they are partnering again to enter the F3 Carnivore Challenge. Let's hear from Karim and Veramaris's progress to date. The great news about our Veramaris algal oil is actually we have both molecules, EPA and DHA. So not only do we satisfy the health of salmon, but we also ensure that the food is healthy, nutritious and ideal for consumers. Our Veramaris algal oil enables retailers to promote salmon sustainably and to promote a very healthy and nutritious salmon to their consumers. Alga i fôr brukar mycket för att dyra hälsa och miljö är väldigt viktigt för oss. Öppen och ärlighet, kvalitet och vara framtidsrättad och kunna producera bärkraftigt är väldigt viktigt för oss. For us, this is the result of 20 years of innovation, finding a good sustainable source to the omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA. That has been the biggest bottleneck for us, but now we have the solution. Retailers are the key change agents. In fact, they're fundamental. They've understood that consumers want to know where their food is produced, how it's produced, and the nutritional content. And they're the first ones who've understood that consumers want a sustainably sourced salmon, which is highly nutritious and good for them. Hello, I'm Karim Kramali, the CEO of Veramaris. And that short video hopefully gave you a snapshot of what Veramaris is about. However, I'd like to start first by thanking Barbara and her team at F3 for giving us this opportunity and for all the support they've given us over the past few years. 
If you don't yet know us, well, Veramaris produces a sustainable, pure, natural marine algal oil, which is rich in both EPA and DHA omega-3. We're harnessing the best of what nature has to offer with the mission to expand the world's supply of EPA and DHA omega-3 for aquaculture, pet food, and beyond. We're the first algal oil producer in the world to receive MSC ASC certification and add an estimated 45% to the global supply of MSC certified EPA and DHA omega-3. In fact, integrating Veramaris algal oil into aquafeed can reduce the forage fish dependency ratio for fish oil, FFDR oil, to below one. This means little or no EPA and DHA omega-3 from fish oil is actually required to raise farm fish and farm shrimp. Now, what problems do we actually solve? Well, one of the biggest challenges in the 21st century is meeting the needs of a growing world population while not increasing the pressure on our planet's ecosystems. Aquaculture has a significant role to play in feeding the world. It has to grow within planetary boundaries without placing undue pressure on marine biodiversity. In 2020, 22 million metric tons of wild catch forage fish like anchovies, herrings, sardines were used to produce fish meal and fish oil. These species are rich sources of EPA and DHA omega-3 critical for both human and animal health. But this has led to stocks being fished to their maximum. Aquaculture is the fastest growing food sector. However, its dependence on wild catch fish for EPA and DHA omega-3 will limit its growth and continue to put pressure on our marine ecosystem. This is where we come in. Veramaris provides a sustainable alternative a source of natural algal oil rich in both EPA and DHA omega-3 that helps solve this challenge by reducing reliance on wild catch fisheries, thereby reducing our global impact. Our product can supplement or replace fish oil in aquafeeds and meet the health benefits of seafood. The richness of our algal oil enables farmers to control the nutritional profile of their feed allowing them to consistently raise a robust and healthier fish. The additional benefit of fish raised on a diet rich in EPA DHA is that consumers receive a product which is nutritionally rich, providing the expected health benefits for proper brain and heart development. This means healthy food for consumers. Well, where are we today? Since winning the F3 challenge in 2019, we have come quite a long way. Today, our algal oil is used to grow salmon, shrimp, trout, steelhead trout, yellowtail, sea bream, and sea bass. We've also launched a shrimp that is entirely raised on our algal oil, a vegetarian shrimp with zero fish meal and zero fish oil. This shrimp is available in all 50 US states today. And despite the challenges we have all faced in the past year due to COVID-19, Team Veramaris tripled production in 2020. And using the F3's own forage fish calculator, Veramaris algal oil produce equated to more than 8 billion forage fish. This remarkable achievement is thanks to the dedication of Team Veramaris, colleagues whose purpose is to make a difference in the world which we live. And I'm very proud to be working with such a great team. So how do we make change happen? Well, we believe in partnerships to create the market. We collaborate along the value chain, talking to farmers, feed millers, processors, distributors, retailers, and the consumer. In fact, within the retail sector, we have seen courageous leaders step up and engage their supply chains to de-risk their supply of seafood. They're also requesting transparency to mitigate mit reputational risk for both themselves and their consumers. And this is where Veramari steps in. We collaborate with all parts of the value chain to achieve the continued sustainable production of aquaculture, a source of nutritious, healthy, sustainable seafood. 
I'm already anticipating the question, is it affordable? And the answer is yes. Today, our algal oil is available across the world and both fish and shrimp fed on algal oil are available on the shelves of several retail stores and online in 50 US states for shoppers. Our algal oil is three times richer than fish oil in EPA and DHA. It's sustainable and it's an affordable solution. Algal oil has also been shown to grow the salmon category at certain retail stores and allows the farmer to reverse the decline in omega-3 in the fillet and produce a unique product. Well, what lies in the future for us? Well, at Vera Maris, we're constantly innovating, making continuous improvements to provide our customers with a high concentration algal oil, rich in both EPA and DHA omega-3. And ultimately, making our contribution to healthy fish, healthy food, healthy oceans. We have come a long way. Alternative feed solutions like ours are here now and available at scale. And we are economically viable and leaders in the industry are seeing the opportunity and taking advantage. My colleagues in Team Veramaris are here to support you to make it happen at speed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kareem. It's great to see you again. Um, and what we would like to do uh, next is to uh, bring our panelists on board here, briefly introduce yourselves. And we also want to welcome uh, Katrina Benedicto, who is the Director of Marketing and Communications for New Seed. And she'll be answering questions on behalf of New Seed and uh, Pablo. Uh, so again, to our audience, don't forget to type your questions into the Q&A box so that we can address them now and as we go through these questions. So um, let me uh, turn it over to Alex for the introductions. And how about if we start with uh, David, please. Hi, I'm Dave Hazelbeck, CEO of Global Algae Innovations. It's a pleasure to be here with you. and happy to talk about any questions um, regarding algae oil. Hi everyone and great to be here and thank you very much uh, Kevin for moderating it and thanks to, to all in the panel and thanks again to F3 for uh, in the invitation. Pleasure to be here. And Ruth, good to see you again. Why don't you go ahead please. Good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Ruth Pierre Bums. I'm the president of algae ingredients at, uh, at Corbin. Thank you for, uh, for letting us uh, participate in this webinar. Very interesting. Thank you, Ruud. And Katrina, please introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. My name is Katrina Benedicto, and I am the Director of Marketing and Communications for New Seed Nutritional. All right, thank you. Well, we'll just jump right into the questions then. Um, uh, first one here for David. Um, in your open ponds, are you working with just one target species of algae or do you have a suite of algae that you're taking from a community that develops in your ponds, in your race? Oh, yeah, we're growing a single uh, strain at a time. So we have grown a number of different strains, but we have one primary strain that we're looking at for this particular application for protein and for the various oils that I talked about. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, so uh, Katrina, we have a question here also um, that with your um, uh, canola, um, do you anticipate any kind of problems with uh, climate change? Uh, I know it's more of a temperate crop, so what do you think? Well, I mean, with any kind of agricultural or aquaculture, you're going to be dealing with the elements and nature, but we're We've specifically selected canola for its resilience and for the fact that it's grown on four different continents with regularity. It's uh, grown without water. At least all of ours is grown without water and it's grown with uh, sunshine. So as long as we've got water from rain and sunshine, we'll be okay. We're accustomed to dry farming. Okay. Good, thank you. All right, uh, Ruud. 
uh, algal prime contains uh, primarily DHA. And so for farms, uh, are they going to need to use a mix of DHA and EPA? Uh, that would you recommend for people for salmon diets, et cetera? Yeah, uh, thank you. I mean, of course, I mean, our strain produces uh, 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 DHA. And, and of course, today, I mean, looking at the, the formulations of, of feed, I mean, formulations or, or feed formulations are, of course, a mixture of different ingredients. What we see so far is that indeed uh, adding, uh, adding uh, DHA to the formulation will not, not necessarily create a, uh, a lack of, of DHA or EPA, sorry, because that's also coming from, uh, from the other ingredients in the mix. But of course, I mean, we recognize that inclusion levels need to uh, or, or could increase in the future. So that's also why we work with both our customers, but also with research institutes to continuously increase EPA levels uh, and therefore, let's say, monitor results. And, uh, and, and we see also, let's say, gradual, uh, gradual increase of the DHA only uh, products. So. Therefore, I mean, in a combination, uh, it, 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 it is, of course, proven, uh, but for the future, I mean, we see further increases of DHA alone. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Karim, uh, the question for you is, what fermentation systems are available to produce Baramaris algal oil for a local market within Southeast Asian region? Whoa, that's a tough one for me uh, to I have to say I, I haven't actually looked into uh, Southeast Asia so I personally could not answer that uh, question uh, at this moment in time if you ask me about Europe I can answer because we've got a landscape of fermentation systems in Europe but uh, that's a good one I, I'll, I'll have to look into that and come come back to wh whoever is interested in that question all right, thank you. Um, so th here's one that um, it's addressed to Katrina, but I think it would really apply to to everyone. So I'll, I'll kind of give everybody a chance to uh, take a short answer at this. So uh, how much did the diet price of feed increase when substituting conventional oil, fish oil, with Aquaterra. So Katrina, I'll let you start with that, but uh, we'll, we'll let everybody have an answer to that. Well, Aquaterra has the benefit of being derived from canola, which works within existing infrastructure. It really helps keep our scalability available and our price is low because we are working within existing agricultural systems to be able to produce and transport this product. That said, um, the technology behind it is uh, affordable. It's comparable to fish oils and in our commercial skill trials, which included over 3 million fish in the study, show that fish fed in Aquaterra diet actually decreased mortality by 2%. So in addition to being comparable in feed, you actually increase your ROI by having more production yield. All right, thank you. So Rude, same question. Uh, yeah. You have lots of people in commercialization now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and of course, I mean, we make a statement about being affordable. Yeah, and so the way we look at affordability is you have to deliver omega-3 because, of course, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's what the uh, uh, of interest for, for our customers. So we really compare fish oil at, at omega-3 levels with our product. Our product obviously is high, higher concentrated than fish oil. Um, so, of course, on the kilo price, you will see, uh, see us uh, more expensive. But we strive for the ability to be comparable with fish oil on a omega-3 basis. Okay, good. Uh, David, same question. So as you noted, we're pre-commercial, so I can't say in terms of when we've replaced it, but I can say that our, our targets for all of our production is to be competitive, be equal to or lower than the fish oil prices on an omega-3 basis. Also, I should note, this is a photosynthetic system, so we actually have the reverse oil of almost everybody else. Ours is high in EPA and lower in DHA. It has both, but it's much more EPA than, than DHA. All right, thank you. And Karim. So the key point, I guess, is, is the feed more expensive? And the way we should look at it is this way. 
if you have an al algal oil, which is, let's say, 2.5 times more concentrated than Peruvian fish oil or three times more concentrated than Atlantic fish oil, it utilizes less space in the feed formulation. That's the first thing. And thereby, by utilizing less space in the feed formulation than fish oil, you're able to bring in additional cheaper raw material ingredients into that feed formulation. So in essence, the total feed cost should not necessarily increase. Furthermore, you're actually transporting less product across the ocean because the Veramaris algal oil, as I've said, is 2.5 times more concentrated than, than Peruvian and three times more concentrated than uh, North Atlantic. So the opportunity uh, to actually negate increase in feed costs is there. And that's why, as we were saying, it is definitely affordable. And that's why you've got salmon and shrimp on the supermarket shelves today. So uh, a smart feed formulationist can truly uh, reap the benefits of algal technology. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, David, another question for you. Uh, you cited a tenfold uh, cost reduction. And the question uh, we received was, uh, it just I think you just can give a rough percentage. How much of this was economy of scale versus new uh, innovations or inventions like, like your harvester, for example? Yeah, so it's almost all inventions. That's really all we've been focused on for the last seven years. So we haven't really focused on the product development until just recently because we needed to be able to make a cost competitive product before we started looking at the different markets you could go into. And so, as you mentioned, the harvester is 100 times less energy than traditional algae harvesting technology. We have an extraction system that uses 20 times less energy than typical extraction. Our inoculation system is 1,000 times smaller. We use six grams of algae inoculum to make three metric tons of product. So it's, it's a much smaller inoculation system. And I mean, I could go through the whole thing. There's about we list out 65 major innovations of which 11 we consider major breakthroughs where there were more than an order of magnitude change in, in one of our target areas. Okay. On your Zobi harvester, can you give us just a, a rough idea? Is this a rotating drum type filter or spray yep. filter? What? Yeah, it's, it's a dead end uh, hollow fiber membrane filter similar to what's used in wastewater treatment. And the big innovation we've done is figured out how to use that and still get high fluxes and high concentration. So we can take it all the way from pond levels, which in open pond systems is very dilute, about a gram per liter, all the way up to 200 grams per liter uh, in a single um, membrane filtration system. Excellent, okay, good to know. Thank you. Um, uh, so here's one for Katrina. Uh, for new seed, is the product available for markets with GMO limitations? <laughs> We do have regulatory advancement in several markets around the world. We are currently um, providing quite a bit of product to Chile and the fish producers in that region. And uh, keep posted on the news. You'll see some new regulatory announcements coming shortly. I'll leave it at that. Okay, good. We'll look for good news there. All right. Um, so Karim, uh, can you tell us more about your partnership with Epingran to produce uh, your uh, fish-free feed for shrimp? Yes, certainly. Uh, we were able, together with uh, a, a major integrator in, in Ecuador called Empregan, to, to work with them and remove fish meal and fish oil from their shrimp feed. So in a sense, they've got a plant-fed shrimp totally vegetarian, which they're introducing or have it already introduced into the US market and now uh, making it available for, for the European market. But it's, it's a wonderful product, uh, primarily because it has literally zero fish meal and zero fish oil. So uh, I, I think we're, we're very excited. They're very excited. And, and a number of retailers uh, who've already onboarded it uh, and actually gave us results uh, literally last week were very, I would say, uh, impressed with the taste, texture, and most importantly, the high profile of omega-3 in the shrimp. The actual 
results showed that there was three times more omega-3 in the shrimp than regular standard shrimp. And that, I have to say, we were, we were not necessarily planning for that. But once we understood the shrimp physiology and digestive uh, tract, we understood how and why. At least we have an understanding as to how you can actually get a higher level of omega-3 into shrimp, which is uh, something that we will actually work on with, uh, with other partners as well, more than likely in, in Asia Pacific. Because I think shrimp with a higher level of omega-3 could actually be a completely new uh, position and category versus the traditional shrimp. So we're, we're quite ex interested in that. I don't have all the answers as to how we will market that or support, but uh, the fact that there is this opportunity, I think it excites us all in, in Team Vera Maris. Great, Thank you. great news. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, Rude, we had another question here. Uh, not sure if you can share this. How many kilos of sugar is needed to produce one kilo of oil? And then where does the waste go? Yeah, well, thank you, uh, because that's, that's actually a very interesting, uh, interesting question. So first of all, the, uh, let's say we're looking at different, uh, different um, angles uh, when we look at, at, at yields. That's of course how many kilos of sugar we use, but also at how fast can we, can we get the, the product to produce? and especially at how much concentration can we get out of one kilo of sugar. So the kilo of sugar is not per se determining the price or the cost alone, it's, um, it's also the other parts. And then to the second part of your question, because I think that's even, even more interesting, we have no waste. So we harvest sugar, yeah? the sugar part of the cane goes into, uh, into, uh, into the fermenter and is being eaten by, uh, by the algae. The waste, what we call bagasse, goes into a uh, into a burner and is burned for steam and for electricity, and that we also get over the fence from the uh, from the uh, from the, um, the sugar mill. So we have a closed system on energy and uh, and heat. And then when you look at our biomass, I mean, indeed, we uh, we make a uh, liquid suspension, uh, meaning that also from there are no biostreams from the product as such. So we ferment. And then basically the entire algae product goes into liquid suspension and is supplied as such to the customers. Also there we have basically eliminated waste and therefore make an whole algae product but suitable in an application for customers. Hope that answers your, uh, your question. I hope so. Yes, it does to me. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, uh, this is um, for everyone, uh, and it's going to apply to your different products. So, um, are there any particular challenges or advantages to these novel sources of omega threes when it comes to oxidation and oil quality when producing the feed uh, or in the final product? So, uh, Katharina, why don't we start with you? I don't have a comparative analysis for how our oil oxidizes uh, next to fish oil on hand. So I, I wish I could answer that for you right now. I, I cannot. Okay, that's all right. I'm not sure anybody can, but let me go ahead and go around. Uh, Rude, what do you think? Uh, sorry, I mean, in my introduction, I, I stated that I had a business degree. So sorry on this one, <laughs> I have to take a pass. But I mean, happy, happy to connect you with our nutrition team. To, to answer these questions, because I'm sure that our team uh, have, uh, have a full answer on this one. Yeah, okay. Karim, any chance to know that one off the top of your head? If you can repeat the question, I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, so, uh, they, they took it off my screen here, but basically it was, <laughs> uh, how does uh, uh, your product compare with the oxidation of uh, other uh, traditional fish oil. Okay, I, I, I would I would There's say no oxidation or rancidity compared to what normal yeah, oil would be. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that uh, our algal oil is uh, is is protected using natural uh, tocopherols, which are antioxidants. Mm -hmm. So, in a sense, uh, we we guarantee a shelf life of twelve months for for this particular oh, okay. product. So, it's, so in that respect, it's very similar, I would say, to, to, to fish oil. 
the yeah. key point with the algal oil obviously is you have a consistent product 365 days a year 24 7 which unlike mm -hmm. fish oil fluctuates seasonally and obviously yeah. depends on from which fishery you you source it from so i think that's another key advantage of the algal oil uh, the algal technology that is available uh, at the moment yeah mm -hmm. but i would say no no real difference between uh, algal oil and, and fish oil Okay, thank you, appreciate that. David, any chance you guys have done any of that? So we haven't done it yet. We're actually just starting uh, feed trials this year. That is something we're measuring at each step right now though, is, is uh, rancidity as it moves through and, and, and checking that. And we're using the standard techniques though for preventing oxidation of the fatty acids. Good, thank you, that, that's big help. Um, Okay, um, so here's another one. The use of land-based products has resulted in a decline in the DHA content of salmon meat and an increase in linoleic acid content typical of seed oils. Uh, anybody wanna comment on that particular aspect? I'd like to take that one. Please, please do. Uh, what we've been finding is that what happens when Aquaterra is included as the partial replacement for fish oil, that we actually not only increase the total omega-3 in the harvested filet with an NQC cut, we also have an improved balance in the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. It's because the technology that goes into our canola oil, not only does it have the DHA EPA comparable to fish oil, it also has an extremely high level of ALA in there, which helps with that balance, but we find that it forward converts into EPA too. It's really quite beneficial to the overall composition of the, the oil feed. Okay, uh, Rude, you have any comment on, on that? Yeah, so, I mean, we, uh, um, um, of course, I mean, we, we deliver indeed a combination of, uh, of both products, but indeed our focus is uh, if you can bring in highly concentrated Anka free sources, because in the end, uh, you will have to sort of have a competition for, for different ingredients in the feed formulation. So we really believe that it is important to bring in highly concentrated Anka three um, uh, ingredients so that you can really improve that balance, uh, basically restore, let's say, restore nature as such. So bringing in high concentration of omega-3 will take up less space and therefore can restore those balances. Okay. Karim, I think you kind of addressed it already, but anything to add? I think what Root said is very clear. Uh, and uh, I think the algal technology offers the, the salmon industry a unique opportunity to reverse the decline of omega-3 due to the scarcity and unpredictability of fish oil. Now, and at scale, salmon farmers, shrimp farmers, well, aquaculture farmers have a predictable, consistent product. And by utilizing a consistent product, it lends itself to A, reversing the decline of omega-3, but more importantly, allows you to then make a label claim because then you, for once, you have a consistent omega-3 profile in the feed and hence in the flesh. Just like we did with the, with the shrimp. If we consistently find times three more omega-3 in the shrimp, we'll be able to motivate retailers and even the producers to start to label that. And that really is healthy food for consumers. And my point is, I think if consumers are provided an informed decision, in other words, can view the pack, can read the labels on the pack, they will make the right purchase. So I think the algal technology, as Ruud said, you know, high concentrations, consistency, that's, that's, that's going to be, I would say, the new uh, breakthrough in, in aquaculture, that we're going to start to see labeling and branding backed up with clear labeling of omega-3 levels in, in, in seafood. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, uh, next question is um, the 
questioner says he assumes that uh, your oils would lack any heavy metal contamination that's common in, in fish oils. Um, and does that translate into less heavy metal contamination in the end fish product? Uh, and they're interested in any statistics or study that, that verifies that. So, uh, uh, David, you wanna handle yeah, that we first? Have, we don't have the studies yet, but we do have very low metal. So yeah, it's gonna be much lower metal content. Uh, all of our water is recycled within the system. So any metal water, that, metals that come in with the water are taken out in the first batch essentially that you harvest out. And then it's pretty much, I mean, from the harvester, it's all recycled, it's clean water. And so therefore there's no metals really entering the system. Um, okay. And I would say that, that it goes for the protein as well because you know, the protein meal that we're producing, we also look as an aquaculture feed ingredient. It's highly digestible uh, sure. and, uh, and, and so, for both the protein meal and the oil. Yeah, yeah. Katrina, new seed? Well, all of our oil is processed um, and filtered, but there's not going to be the heavy metal contaminants or bioaccumulation in a plant based product. Root? Yeah, so I mean, here we really benefit also from. Uh, as I explained before, the, the, the experience that we have as Corbin with large scale industrial fermentation. So basically we buy sugar and, 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 and other nutrients and all of them are clearly specced on, on every, let's say in every detail of what we want to bring in. And that means if we don't bring something into our plant because we have a closed system, it won't also come out. So it's it's really having a, having a, a, a clear control on your uh, on your feedstocks and your raw materials, and then basically the product is also free of contaminants. So we check at the beginning, we check at the end, and basically that guarantees us to be uh, to be uh, contaminant free. Okay, good, thank you. Um, okay, uh, let's go on to the next question here. Um, again, kind of for everyone, for industrial applications in the feed mills. Uh, what are the advantages of delivering product in liquid form or powder form? Um, so, Grim, why don't you address that Certainly. first? So, quite a, uh, a large portion of fish feed uh, today uh, utilizes fish oil as, as a source of omega-3. So, it lends itself that when we are producing an algal oil, it's readily applicable for the fish feed industry. In fact, the uh, oil, fish oil, is actually vacuum coated after the extrusion of a fish pellet. And our algal oil basically fits in into that uh, system. So it's fully applicable uh, and utilizable in, in, in fish feed. Similarly, in shrimp feed, uh, fish oil can either be, if it's extruded, be vacuum coated post, post uh, extrusion and or applied in uh, feed mixes in a spraying device, which is what and how fish oil is used. So that's one of the reasons why with Veramaris, we went for a pure algal oil solution to enable uh, our stakeholders and our clients not to have the issue of application problems or, or handling. So algal oil basically replaces fish oil in, in any feed mill. So application is not an issue at all. You don't have to invest in additional equipment or stirrers or, or whatever. You just simply pipe it through your, through your system as you would have done fish oil. Hence, it's a direct replacement. Okay, good. Thank you. Rud? Yeah, so we have, um, let's say we are looking, so we have both products. We have a liquid version and a, and a powder one. And basically, um, what we uh, what our what our direction is is that we allow our customers base to make the choice and to produce with what they have today. So, in some applications, for example, we see shrimp or, or feeds that use uh, use no extrusion uh, uh, powders are preferred because all the other raw materials are also in powder and then they are blended together. Obviously, in some other applications, it's a liquid form, uh, especially in extrusion or vacuum coating. And then, of course, a liquid product can be uh, can be produced. So, I mean, both both uh, areas are are possible. We have an application team with a fully equipped lab, 
to basically test all the different applications. And even if both would be an option, then we're more than happy to support that type of work to see in advance which one would fit best. And then, I mean, use it to your liking. Great. Katrina. Our product is currently available only in oil form. There might be other products in development. Uh, as in oil, it is a drop in replacement for fish in terms of ease of formulation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And David? So our oil would be also a liquid form. Right now, we it's a co-product really, or byproduct from our separations because we're primarily making oil for polymers and oil for fuel. And when we separate uh -huh. the, for that, we also get a separate stream that comes out that's omega-3s. It's about 15% of our oil product. And so that'll be a liquid, the protein's a powder. Okay, good, thank you. Um, so here's a question uh, from China. Uh, are any of you selling uh, product in, in China? Do you, anybody have distributors there? Uh, Yes. For selling into aquaculture industry. Yeah. So David, no. Rude. Yes, we, we yes. do. Yeah, we are, um, let's say, we have imported the first product. We are finalizing, uh, let's say, uh, all the regulatory uh, uh, data. But yes, we are, um, I expect as, as from next month, give us one and a half month to be really okay. sure we will be able to supply in, in China. So happy to, uh, to connect with you to... Um, yeah, to see what is possible in the Chinese market. Thank you. Katrina, you guys selling anything in China yet? Not yet. Again, we just launched commercially um, less than a year ago. So China's definitely on the radar, but we're, we're not ready right now. All right, sure. Karim, yeah. We've got a distributor for the pet food sector. And ah, actually, okay. uh, we're looking for a distributor for the aquaculture sector. But yes, we, we're registered. And we just need the GAC certification to finalize. Oh, okay. So, as as Rude was saying, we also are in a, perhaps a few weeks or months, but definitely this year. Yeah. Okay. And that's uh, okay. quite exciting as well. Obviously. Completely different market. Completely different yeah. market. So, uh, yeah, lots to learn. Lots to learn. <laughs> but a huge market, nevertheless. <laughs> Exactly. Okay, and, and, and I know I have a similar question from Vietnam, so we'll just keep that. Uh, hopefully somebody finds a distributor in Vietnam soon. Well, Vietnam, we're there. So uh, if, you if, there? Is a, if there's a question for Vietnam, no issue, yeah. Wonderful, okay. I, I had that question yesterday from somebody, so I'll get them in touch. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Rude, this just came in. Uh, the recent life cycle analysis results show that Algo Prime has lower carbon footprint than fish oil. Can you explain why this is and what this means for Algo Prime? Yeah. Well, the, the reason why it's lower is, of course, uh, we, we do not add any, any additional energy. So having, having a 100% green, uh, green energy stream from, like I explained before, we burn the bagasse of the, um, of the sugar cane, therefore generate steam and electricity at the same time. And that really gives us a, a, a huge benefit in combination with the fact, of course, that we very efficiently transform then sugar into, um, uh, into, uh, uh, into, into omega-3. Gives us also a low footprint, footprint from, uh, let's say, raw material point of view. So that's basically the combination. Our LCA study will be published uh, uh, soon. It is being peer reviewed because we really believe in, we can say whatever we want, but we really want to have the opinion of other people to judge what we are doing. So transparency and sustainability go hand in hand. Um, so measure what you do, be transparent about it. And therefore we say, we want to have our LCA peer reviewed so that people can comment and then we will publish it. Uh, we're already sharing them with customers. Again, we want to be fully transparent. So, um, uh, so once it is, uh, is fully publicized, I mean, everybody can look into how, let's say, we build our carbon footprint cycle and, uh, and how, we, how we look at that. Okay, good. Here's kind of a related question uh, for Katrina. Um, Aquaterra was just certified as a sustainable omega-3 by Friend of the Sea. What was required to meet this certification and why was this a priority for NUSI? Well, the Friend of the Sea certification 
while it says friend of the sea, we went through the friend of the earth certification process, which it really went deeply into our agricultural practices, what our expectations are in terms of stewardship and land management with any of the contracted farmers that we work with, as well as the whole production from our seed production, the transportation, and even the manufacturing process for our oil crushing and transport. So it's really been identified through this vetting process that our, our product is not only reducing pressure on the sea, but has a very positive benefit to the farm environment where we're growing. One of the things that we've committed to is that we do not use new farmland for any of our production, that we go in and work with an existing canola farmland, or even better to be grown as an off-cycle rotational crop to be able to prevent fallow for any season, which is uh, beneficial to soil too. Okay, great. Um, okay. Da, 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 da. Um, I think you guys have probably already answered this, but let me go ahead and pose it anyway. Will the algae oil or seed oil affect the feed palatability? Anybody found any problems or, or benefits, I guess? Yeah. Maybe, maybe I, can, uh, I can answer that. I mean, we have done uh, uh, numerous, numerous studies on, on Elta Prime. And basically what we, uh, what we saw is that we actually increased the palatability of, um, of, of the feed uh, while using, uh, using algae. We are doing more research on that because, of course, it's an interesting, uh, interesting point. Yeah, but the, uh, um, yeah, the, uh, the the palatability clearly showed in a, in a, in, a, in a study done in Norway uh, to be higher. But so more work to be done. Uh, but it seems to have a positive impact. Great, Katrina, please. Are we referring to the palatability of the fish feed or the palatability of the the fillet? I think they're talking in this case uh, of the uh, feed to the fish, yeah. Well, based on or our feed conversion or rates and uh, the growth and feed intake, it, it looks as though the fish do appreciate the taste of the, the aquaterra inclusion. Okay, great. And uh, Karim, I assume the same? Yeah, I, I would say there's, there's no difference, I would say. Uh, however, interestingly, and that's just a, a short note, is actually uh, in, with companion animals, uh, we've actually shown, proven, a higher preference from al for algal oil relative to fish oil in dogs and cats. Don't, don't ask me why and don't ask me the details. We're, we're still investigating, but it, 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 we've done it twice in... in uh, in prescribed uh, trials, uh, independent, I would say. And uh, yeah, good results. We're trying to figure out why. It's obviously that uh, something with companion animals, dogs and cats, that they, they, they just have a better palatability system than we have to differentiate between an algal oil and a fish oil, thankfully. So <laughs> welcome results. But that's what I wanted to share with you. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, oh, this is kind of a global question. How can we manage the competing demand between the demand for fuel and food? Is algae and other new plant-based products able to have the efficiencies and sustainability characteristics? Uh, David, why don't you take that one first? Sure, so uh, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, we're, the product we're making has a fuel component, has a consumer product component, the omega-3s for fish oil, as well as a protein. And we're actually making far more protein per acre than you could get from a conventional crop. So in addition to the fuel, you're getting far more protein from that same acreage. So you know, that's the big advantage of, of, uh, of algae is that you can meet both the fuel and food needs without, and at the same time, actually use less acreage than we use now for food. Okay. And, and kind of a similar question came in uh, regarding uh, cane sugar in, in Corbian's case. Uh, so, Rude, why don't you address that? Yeah, yeah, obviously, I mean, 
we uh, while we use let's say cane sugar as a as a feedstock yeah, opposite to to uh, uh, to fish oil, we we see a different input cost variation than than we see with fish oil. Um, I think one of the advantages of, of algae is that it's a, a, a same production all year round. Yeah, we ferment, we do not ferment. We, we are not dependent on nature for a fermentation process. Yeah, we do it in a fermentation, uh, in a fermenter. And so that means that the production is very stable. Um, with the sugar input cost, obviously, I mean, now we see some increases, uh, but in some, some cases you also see, uh, see decreases here. We really make, uh, make use of the fact that Corbin is also using large amounts of sugar for the production of lactic acids. So we are a large uh, uh, buyer of sugar and therefore our system to uh, manage pricing and to guarantee price stability is, uh, is, is, is already in place. So we're just banking on what we already have. Um, and of course, we try to manage that as, as well as we can. We've talked about, let's say, this uh, comparison with the market. Uh, and, uh, and and that's what we uh, what we're committed to. So using our systems, we think uh, we don't do not need to um, do not need to follow the market very short, but we can extend those uh, those um, those uh, those impacts, and then make sure that our customers uh, are are getting more stable prices throughout the year and throughout the years. Okay, good. And. Karim, we had kind of a similar one about corn and, and uh, varimaris and of corn prices increasing recently. That, that's correct. I mean, corn, corn prices, I think wheat prices, a lot of soft commodity prices have increased. However, uh, similar to, to uh, other uh, panelists, we, we have long-term contracts. So uh, we're in a sense, uh, covered uh, and to and to also another point is we're continuously improving the capability of our of our algae such that actually it requires less and less sugar to produce more and more oil uh, we, and this continuous improvement program uh, has been ongoing in fact uh, we intend to launch uh, very soon uh, uh, a new algal oil product which has even richer uh, EPA and DHA than the previous, we're going to do a soft launch. So uh, that also adds to the improvement or the capability of the algae to convert uh, sugar into into omega three oil. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's so that's how we work on it. We not only hedge ourselves on sugar, but we also continuously improve the capability of the strain. And it's a continuous learning learning process. It's biology, and it's 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 learning, you know. Yeah. Learning by doing. Very good. All right. And, and Katrina, uh, we'll give that to you also. I mean, we know canola tends to grow in higher latitudes. Uh, so climate warming is probably going to be good for you guys. But uh, why don't you address that? I, I don't think I can. Um, you're talking about uh, the cost of inputs into it? I'm sorry. No, just, ju just the fact that uh, this is kind of going back to uh, feed demand versus use for uh, uh, making a fish oil replacement. Well, just like the other commodities, canola has gotten to be significantly more expensive this year. Um, as we go into our contracts, we do need to make sure that we're remaining competitive to our farmers. But it's also important to know that our product has inherent value in it because of the product, the output of the DHA and the EPA. We're, we're not expecting any significant increase in prices because of commodity prices right now. Okay, okay. oh goodness. We got a last question that may be uh, the best. Um, so this will go for everybody. Um, what would the panelists like to see happen to help speed the adoption of alternative omega-3 sources and help to reach scale? What is the role of regulators and certifiers? And should something similar to the E10 mandate for fuel in Europe be applied for aquafeeds? So, Rude, why don't you start with that? You have the biggest grin. 
um, no, I think, I mean, honestly, looking, looking at, um, uh, let's say, the speed of, of adoption, um, it's not per se, let's say, regulation that is holding us, uh, holding us back. Um, obviously, yeah, uh, depending on the region, in, uh, so in Europe, aqua feed, it is, it is pretty, uh, pretty okay. Um, obviously, there, there are areas in the world where, um, uh, where regulation uh, uh, could be helped uh, and where regulation doesn't 100% fit. But honestly, that's not the, uh, the, the first, um, how do you say, the, the, the major hurdle. I would say the major hurdle is, is more in, in ourselves as an industry. I mean, change is hard. And you see that usually one change requires another change. So what we are trying to do here is basically adapt the entire supply chain from the beginning to the end. So it's all also all uh, uh, to all of us yeah, to smoothen the next steps for people in the value chain, um, but also uh, let's say for people to um, uh, to sometimes do it a little bit different than how we have done it before. Uh, if we uh, if we think that with the same input we get the same output, I think there has been one famous person that had said something about that. That's called madness. So. If you want to get change, yeah, you have to change yourself. Um, so I would say to all the people at the at the at the team here, at the at the webinar here today, let's drive change together, and then I'm I'm sure we'll make it done. Okay, David, you want to add something? Uh, well, I would say for us, it's kind of a totally different, I'd say, than the other products here because everybody else is taking advantage of an existing cultivation or production infrastructure, mm -hmm. we're creating a whole new production system. And so our, our issues are a little different than, than everyone else's. And so for us, getting to scale is the primary, uh, primary impediment right now. And uh, we're moving that direction. We're hoping to build out next year. But that's, that's really the, the key uh, stepping stone right now is, is scaling this new technology or new cultivation process up so that it can be competitive with the other existing processes. And you're looking at some place in Southern California for that second farm? Uh, we're actually building it in the central coast of California. So it's, oh, okay. it, it's a little bit inland there in a farming community. Okay, good, thank you. Karim? I would say uh, policy regulations E10 helps. It supports and it accelerates adoption of new technologies. But more importantly, the, the point is this, it, an, ex, an idea like E10 would definitely support and re, re, remove pressure on our fisheries, allowing certain fisheries, particularly those which are overfished to recover. So I would say, you know, beyond our own business, looking at the planetary issues and challenges that we're all facing, uh, with regards to decimation of terrestrial and more importantly, marine biodiversity, an E10 policy will help support recovery of fisheries, which I think is critical. So beyond our business, I think we need to, we need to motivate uh, regulators to, to do what is required, not only just to enable algal technologies to be adopted, but I think more importantly is to look at everything we can do to enable fisheries to recover. And if E10 is the idea, then yes, let's do it. If we benefit, okay, we do. But more importantly, it's what are we going to do to address the challenges our planet is facing, which is decimation of biodiversity and obviously climate change. So I welcome it from that perspective. Great, thank you. And Katrina, we'll give you the last word. Well, thank you for that. I think uh, a major part of what's going to happen in driving change here is actually consumer demand and consumer awareness. One of the things that's positive that's come out of COVID is that there's actually this great deal of optimism that consumers have developed for seeing the immediate changes in greenhouse gases after we all started to stay home. People feel empowered to be able to make change. And all of the products that we're putting out there positively impact change with the industry. There's more awareness of what's happening in terms of the ocean and what's really not a sustainable way for us to be able to grow 
aquaculture to its fullest potential to feed people as efficiently as possible. I am grateful for everyone at this table to be able to have wonderful options there. And I do believe that it's going to be a combination of industry committing to its own sustainable growth to regulation from government agencies and really our commitment to educating and creating demand from the consumer. A lot of that should be coming from institutional purchasing, whether it's large retailers like the Walmarts and the Ikeas of the world, or whether it's going to major university systems like University of California that has massive purchasing within the United States. That's where I see the change happening. And I, I believe that what we are at is the beginning of a new industry. Great, well, thank you very much. We really appreciate that from uh, everyone. And um, just as a uh, reminder, let me just give, uh, uh, everybody, just another minute or two uh, to uh, any closing remarks. So, David, anything you want to add? I would just echo you know, the result, what was just said, which is basically, you know, all of these, all of us up here are, are working on ways to improve the uh, earth, especially improve our sustainability for biodiversity, both on land and in the ocean. And so we need all of the above. And it's not that, you know, and, and all of us uh, need to succeed in order to really bring about the change that's needed. Great, thank you. Karim. I would uh, reiterate exactly what David said. I think uh, f feeding 10 billion in 2050 is gonna take a lot of talent, a lot of brain power. And, and thankfully, you know, with, with the guidance, I think what F3 is doing in cultivating that, I think is very critical. I don't, I hope you understand how, how important you all are in the F3 in, in making this happen. I really think we have a mountain to climb. It's not gonna be easy uh, readdressing some of the challenges that we're facing on the planet, but the technologies which are coming to the front as long as they're adopted at scale and rapidly, I think they will be successful. So we, we need every uh, NGO certification body, uh, as Katrina said, retailer like Walmart, courageous leaders to take also the initiative and the first step in the right direction together with us all. We're all here for the continued sustainable growth of aquaculture. Good. Rude, anything to add? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. No, I mean, it's, it's clear that, that although, let's say, the last two years have been uh, dreadful in many, many, many ways, uh, I mean, in the world, I think it has also brought something good. And that's sometimes, of course, strange to say with, uh, with, with all the bad things that happened. But I think it has opened people's minds. So I think next to all of us, indeed, we are all working here on a, on a sustainable, uh, uh, on the improvement of the industry. I think the good thing is that, that consumers' minds have opened. And of course, it's up to us uh, to support that and really make sure that that's sort of the, the, new, the new normal. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a buzzword, but I think going back to the old normal is, is, not, a, is, is not a direction we should go. So we really, we need to enable that new normal. Yeah, and what does that mean? True sustainability, uh, the word has been mentioned a lot, but to me that means be transparent and make sure that you don't fight over sustainability, who is most sustainable, but just prove it. I mean, the um, uh, sustainable development goals and the science-based targets are nice models to really uh, build on what you do. So sustainability, science-based, then uh, make it affordable. Um, of course, a lot of people are talking about price, and, and, but I think if people are willing to change, consumers are willing to change, then also enable that change, not with a premium that is sustainable, not, not, not uh, reachable for the masses. So it should deliver consumer products that are affordable for everybody. Um, and then thirdly, that enables skill. Uh, I mean, more demand enables skill, but skill also enables affordability. So I really see affordability and skill as a, as a combination. So we have to drive the uh, volume, build on the positive momentum that COVID has brought us and then change the world. So 
So, and I think with everything, sustainability, affordability, and scale, we have the key in hand. So let's make the change. I'm positive. Thank you. All right. And Katrina. I want to say thank you to F3 for putting together a visionary oh. challenge to be able to remove the sea from the seafood, that it is possible to be able to make sustainable feed options or more sustainable feed options with grander visions, that if we can't imagine it, it won't happen. So thank you for putting that out there. Thank you, appreciate it. All right, um, let me just make a couple final comments here. And, uh, but before we wanna wrap up, I do wanna give all uh, thanks to uh, all of you. Uh, for your time and your comments, uh, all the information you were able to share. Um, and let you know that we had uh, between the Zoom and the live stream, uh, about 27,900 people who were listening in today. Uh, so uh, thank you all for, for that. Uh, for years, we've been replacing fish oil uh, has been a daunting technical challenge. But as we've seen here today, there are several strong substitutes in the pipeline and even available now. These ingredients bring hope for a future of feed that is not dependent on dwindling marine resources, but instead strengthened by having multiple tools to meet nutritional requirements. We hope this seminar was helpful to learn more about omega-3 oils and their use to replace fish oil and aquafeeds. Uh, I'd like to invite you all to our next webinar on emerging trends with alternative feeds for salmonids, which will be June 17th at 5 a.m. GMT, uh, 1 p.m. Uh, Beijing time. Uh, also, before we go, please just take a couple of minutes to watch the closing credits here uh, on this video from the F3 team. And thank you all again. <laughs>